Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, EC Distinguished uh, Webinar Series. Uh, today we have our speaker, uh, Howard Lee uh, from University of California, Irvine. He, he will talk about extreme light matter interaction in zero index materials and meta optical fibers. Uh, Howard Lee is currently an associate professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UC Irvine. Uh, before joining UC Irvine, he was an associate professor in the Department of Physics at uh, Baylor University and IQAC fellow and visiting professor in the Institute of Quantum Science and Engineering at Texas A&M. Uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Caltech working with uh, Professor Harry Atwater in active plasmonics and metasurfaces. He received his PhD in physics from the Max Planck Institute uh, for Science of Light in Germany in 2012. Uh, under the supervision of uh, Professor Philip Russell. His work on nano-optics, plasmonics, and photonic crystals has led to 35 journal publications in various journals, such as Science, Nano Letters, Advanced Materials, ACS Photonics, and uh, Laser and Photonics Review, many invited talks, conference papers, uh, what not to uh, uh, mention. Dr. Lee is also a recipient of 2020 SPIE Rising Researcher, a 2020 Baylor Outstanding Professor Award, a 2019 DARPA Director's Fellowship, and 2019 IEEE OGC Young Scientist Award, and 2018 NSF Career Award, and 2017 DARPA Young Faculty Award, and 2018 OSA Ambassador, and 2017 APS Robert S. Heyer Award, and 2018 Baylor Young Investigator Award, and 2012 Croucher Postdoctoral Fellowship. He organized more than 10 technical sessions in nanophotonics, metasurfaces, in international conferences, and is a founding associate editor for OSA Continuum and associate, associate editor for Nature Scientific uh, Reports Journal. So, without much ado, uh, let's welcome Howard Lee, uh, and the floor is yours, Howard. Thank you very much for the introduction. So um, I'm Howard Lee from UCF, I'm from the Department of Physics and Astronomy, at the same time affiliated with the Batman Laser Institute. So first of all, I'd like to thank you, Guru, and also the department to invite me to be here uh, to tell you something about my research. So I was actually in um, Texas for a couple of years, uh, not too far away from Houston. I was in Waco for a couple of years. I think last time I visited Rice uh, University, maybe uh, two years ago, when I visited the uh, nano fabrication uh, facility there. So it's a really impressive uh, facility. So uh, it's a little bit pity now we cannot uh, meet in person, but I hope everyone is doing fine and doing good at the moment. It's still quick to share with you about our, our research uh, in this uh, virtual platform here. So what I'm going to tell you today is, is a topic related to the light matter interaction in seal index material and also the uh, matter optical fiber. But before I go into detail of my talk, maybe just let me uh, quickly introduce a little bit more about myself first, as some of you may not be too familiar with. So I'm originally from Hong Kong, I graduated from City University of Hong Kong. And during the last year of my undergraduate, I have a chance to um, uh, move to Sydney as an exchange student and working actually in the group of uh, Kudos in, Ben Anderton Group, which is one of the uh, really good research institute in Australia. So this year actually in Sydney is changing my life quite a lot because this is the first time I do my undergrad research in photonics. And that's also why I fell in love in photonics and also spent my whole career in photonics and optics. And at the same time, I also met my wife there um, in Sydney as she's from Taiwan. She was also an exchange student. So certainly it was changed my life as well. So that's why I always uh, encourage the, my undergrad student or graduate student, if, if you have a chance, just go overseas to explore and you may be able to find maybe your future career or something you're interested. Uh, even if not, maybe you can find your future spouse uh, overseas as well. So anyway, um, it's, a, it's a great uh, year where I actually uh, having uh, quite a lot of change in my life. That's why I actually moved to Germany uh, as a PhD student in Mass Plan Institute for Science of Light in Philip Russell Group. So Philip is uh, famous on uh, photonic crystal fiber. He also invented photonic crystal uh, fiber as well. 
And he actually recently retired in Maspan, but he's still keeping uh, a, a small research group to doing research in uh, London, Germany. And after my PhD, I moved to uh, Caltech as a postdoc in heavy aerobic group. So working on uh, plasmonic uh, metal surface. And uh, as Google says, I, I, I moved to Baylor as an assistant professor uh, about five years ago. And uh, recently, uh, we find we actually like to move back to California. That's why I have been starting a position at UCF a couple of months ago in, uh, as an associate professor. So about my lab, uh, we're working on nano optics, so focusing on light matter interaction in a nanometer scale. We have a couple of areas we're working on, for example, uh, active plasmonic matter surface, like for example, electrical tunable, nonlinear matter surface, or making matter fiber optics, uh, studying steel index material, or working a little bit on quantum biophotonic uh, spectroscopy, or even making device and component structure. So we're looking for fundamental um, physics and light matter interaction at the same time, so looking for different applications, for example, for imaging, sensing, communication, or even uh, recently uh, medical and energy application as well. So to just to advertise a little bit, um, because I uh, 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 tried to, uh, we started the group at uh, Irvine, so we are looking for PhD student and postdoc. So if you are interested on the research or if you're interested in moving to Irvine, please let me know. And we are located in quite a nice uh, city uh, with a lot of resource or uh, research and collaboration with the industry at the same time, uh, uh, quite close by with the beach as well. So if you are interested uh, or if you know any um, good student, please let me know as well. Okay, so uh, we're dealing with uh, Leno optics, basically looking on the light matter interaction. So as you may know, when the light interacts with, with a medium, for example, when the light interacts with, uh, with a prism here, you know there are different uh, fundamental optical property will occur and we have been studied for a long time and many things have been uh, well uh, studied already. But when you talk about the light matter interaction, there are a couple of factors you may find which will be important uh, affecting the uh, light interactions. For example, in my opinion, for example, the time scale of the interaction, for example, when you have a light interacting with a molecule or material, except in a femtosecond regime or picosecond regime, or are you looking on the electron dynamic in different regime pressure, which is quite important. At the same time, the dimension is also important because it's telling you how much interaction actually you have with the material itself. And if you go down to really small scale, everything could change as well. Also the material itself, for example, you are dealing with is that a semiconductor dielectric material or even like two dimensional material here. But particularly, um, uh, uh, one factor I think is quite important is actually the dimension. So because uh, you actually can change the light matter interaction if you making structure in a nanometer scale at the same time, maybe even engineering some of the property of the interaction as well. So this is sort of a predict by one of my uh, fam uh, fam famous uh, scientists, which is five months, uh, uh, 60 years ago, he gave a really important lecture at Caltech where he mentioned that there are plenty of room at the bottom. So what that means when you have a material going down to a really small dimension, maybe nanometer scale, all the property, let's say material property, electronic property or optical property could be really different than a bulk material. So this is exactly what we try to study here is trying to looking on some new physics and light matter interaction in a really small dimension, let's say nanometer scale or even atomic scale. So we can do that because nowadays we can have a really good land of fabrication uh, facility. For example, you can making such a really small, maybe smaller than the wavelength of light or even go down to 10 nanometer, 20 nanometer structure. At the same time, we have new material we can study, for example, plasmonic material, metal material, or even two dimensional material, which haven't been studied uh, maybe 10 years ago. So this is actually uh, our motivation on the research is to looking on this kind of new material and nano structure and studying the physics and optics in nanometer scale. At the same time, try to develop different uh, new application we can use some of this new material and nano structure here. But certainly for nano optics, there are a lot of different subtopic you can emerge in, uh, uh, in terms of the nano scale optics. But uh, particularly in this talk, I want to uh, emphasize on two topics to introduce to you. One is the matter surface, and then one is a, actually is a material, which is really interesting, it's called a steel index material. So let me just uh, quickly tell you what exactly is a matter surface. You can think of as an ultra-thin optics. 
So this has been studied quite extensively since uh, 10, 10 years ago from uh, Kapasu group from Harford. What they find is that if they're making a metallic scatter or westernator on top of a surface, you're looking at the top view here, they can actually changing the optical property. For example, normally your light uh, will um, have a normal reflection or reflection on the surface, but now using this kind of metal surface, you can make a anomalous reflection or reflection here. So basically using this kind of lens structure metal surface, you can change all the property of light. For example, the phase, amplitude, compact phase bonds, or even reflection and scattering and treasure. But if you take a, a closer look on another, for example, uh, uh, a figure here, for example, what you can do is making this kind of lens structure with different length or width in one axis. For example, you can change your length here and gradually wear weighting the length as a result, you can gradually changing the phase at the same time, also the phase one as well. So that's why when you like coming in, you can refract in a completely different direction than a normal direction you, you expect in an optics uh, surface. So this is uh, some of the idea of metal surface, basically using this kind of westernator maintainer, for example, simple metallic bar, you can have a metallic westernant. And because you have a metallic westernant here, then if you look at the optical phase, you find you can change the phase for two pi across this wesseling. So that means using one antenna, you can change the amplitude and phase, and that's why you can engineering the structure so that you can uh, constrain the phase precisely to make an artificial phase run. This is exactly what the metal surface do. But just to give you, uh, tell you a little bit how impressive in this metal surface optics here. So this is uh, some of the structure fabricated by the Capasso group uh, using titanium oxide um, metal surface, they can make a lens and when the light coming in, you can focus as a lens as well. But when you look at the dimension, you can see that this is a metal surface lens compared with the uh, bulky optics you have in your lab, which is much thinner here in this metal surface lens. At the same time, the functionality could be quite similar to your bulky optics as well. So this is why it's uh, so impressive on this kind of metal surface, you can scale down all the optics at the same time, the physics is really different than the uh, normal bulky optics. And you can find um, this kind of metal surface component, not only for lenses, it could be also mirror, inspector or polarizer. Basically all the optics you can think of as having a metal surface version, ultra thin version of that. So that's why this has been really exciting for you. And that's why in the last couple of years, there are a lot of exciting and really promising application and property have been discovered in the last couple of years, for example, uh, voltage generation, making ultra thin focusing lens, constraint polarization state, or even metal surface holograph structure. So, I would say um, metal surface is one of the hottest topics in optics in the last couple of years because of the potential advancement on the application at the same time the new physics you can find this kind of structure here. So, so far this is a, a pattern structure, lens structure to create a new phase one. So you can uh, control the light interaction here. But another material I want to introduce to you, which have a really exciting uh, property is so-called this kind of a seal index material, or we call this an epsilon near seal material. Here means uh, epsilon means the permittivity. That means the permittivity is close to seal in this kind of material here. So typically your metal have a permittivity like below seal in the visible range or optical frequency range. And for dielectric, normally your permittivity is above zero. That's why you have a refractive index of 1.5 in your glasses. And epsilon near zero means uh, this material have permittivity close to zero in certain frequency. And in this, especially with GM, this ENC with GM mod, you can find there are a lot of extreme optic you can discover. For example, if you just take a simple uh, boundary condition, if your epsilon close to zero, your electric field can enhance significantly. At the same time, if your epsilon close to zero, your refractive index close to zero, your phase velocity can increase a lot as well. So that's why you can see a lot of really interesting physics and optics you can find this uh, so-called this ENC with GM. And that's why in the last couple of years, there are a lot of exciting demonstration in application and property on this kind of ENC material, for example, making a, 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 a perfect absorption using ENC material, controlling the uh, a coupling or quantum property or enhancing magneto optical effect or enhancing emission, control emission, even voltage generation or quite excitingly also uh, a lot of uh, enhancement on the nonlinearity using ENC material as well. So that's why it's a really exciting field. Again, new material haven't been studied too much so far. 
But so far, if we take a look on most of the report, the metal surface and ENC material, what you find, uh, most of this report, they're mainly, is a passive structure. That means you cannot change the optical property after you fabricate the material or the structure. At the same time, they are panel surface. So most of them, they're just studying in a thin film uh, on a surface. Um, so uh, this is limited, which is not uh, controllable as well. At the same time, so, um, there are no efficient way to really land on engineering some of this, for example, this kind of ENC material. At the same time, some of the enhancement mechanics, and for example, longinality, due to the material or electronic property haven't been really studied so far on this kind of material here. So this is exactly uh, some of the motivation for our research and we're kind of interested, can we making some of the tunable ENC or metal surface device or component or even com combination of the ENC and metal surface so that we can actively control the optical property. At the same time, can we kind of um, uh, engineering the material property of ENC material, for example, we can control the field enhancement, non-inality or emission using some nano engineering. And finally, can we actually integrating some of this uh, technology, metal surface ENC structure into completely different optical platform, for example, optical fiber platform. So this is some of the motivation, and this is actually uh, the outline of my talk, which I will tell you first how we're actually making a tunable linear and non-linear steel index material. And then I will tell you a little bit about how we can using this uh, ENC film film material to enhancing the emission of a 2D material. And then finally, I will tell you a quite different topic on how we're actually integrating some of these metal surface or ENC material in the optical fiber platform. So let me first tell you about uh, studying the uh, linear and nonlinear property of the ENC material. And as I said, the ENC material is a primitive coast to steel. And in order to find this kind of material, you actually can find in different uh, material platforms. For example, if you look at uh, one of the material called conducting oxide material, if you look at the dispersion, you actually can find, you have a seal crossing here. This is actually the ENC regime, and typically they can be in the lean thread or optical regime. That means you can really use it for some uh, optical application here. And this is uh, one of the material we have been using quite a lot as a ENC material. But when we're talking about the ENC material, uh, actually uh, this review paper by uh, Solaye or Bodhisattva from Purdue or even uh, Kinsley from uh, VCU, they actually give a quite good overview um, uh, in this diagram here, basically listing different ENC material for different ENC wavelengths and different losses of the ENC material for different, for example, metals, semiconductor, or even uh, phononic uh, material. So basically you can see that you can have ENC material in different range, UV range, visible, or even near third range. But for more uh, useful application, you may want to find some material in the visible range or lean third range. And particularly on this range, if you take a look, you find the contact angle side actually is one of the good uh, candidates, for example, the ITO, ACO, etc. because you can have a ENC wavelength in the lean in third range. At the same time, they have a relatively low loss uh, uh, material here. And also one good thing is this kind of uh, TCO material, you can actually, tune the property so that you can tune the ENC wavelength to different wavelength so that you can really pick up uh, some uh, different ENC wavelength for different application here. So that's why we have been using um, this conducting oxide material quite a lot uh, as a ENC material. And this kind of conducting oxide material, uh, just to let you know, this is actually a heavy dirt semiconductor. This has been uh, used quite extensively in, for example, your touchscreen application, or displays or even solar application because they have a high transmittance in the visible and near LF and also the, they have a electrical uh, tunability as well. So, and um, the good thing for this uh, conducting oxide material is actually they can have a tunable optical property. So to show you that I'm showing you here as a indium tin oxide material, one of the TCL material and calculating using a standard fee electron Judo model using a capital N here as a carry density and plasma frequency omega p. And if you look at the permittivity, you can see that against the frequency or against the wavelength of light, depending on the care concentration of the material, you can actually have different dispersion and you can shift the dispersion to shorter wavelength if you increase the care density. And at the same time, if you look at the optical frequency, for example, uh, 1.5 micron, you can actually have a dielectric property. That means a uh, positive permittivity or you can have a negative permittivity, that means the metallic property of the material, depending 
on the care concentration of the material. That means it's really good. You can tune in the property of the material by just tuning the care concentration. And other than that, if you look at the seal crossing point, we call this a ENC point, you can shift the ENC wavelength to maybe re interact to even close the visible winch as well, depending on the care concentration. So that means you can really tune this material by uh, changing the care concentration, which can be done by maybe even uh, fabrication condition. When you fabricate the material with different conditions, you can have different care concentration. Or you can also electrically uh, biasing them, uh, gating the material so that you can tune the optical property. So to electrically tuning that, uh, you can emerge and you can just construct a structure like a MOS uh, transistor. You have a metal insulator and semiconductor. And using so-called a field effect by applying an electrical uh, voltage, because you have an insulator here, your electron will accumulate. As a result, you have an increase on the electron density. As a result, you can change the material property at this interface here. So to show you this, I'm plotting the electron distribution of the ITO material for K concentration for different voltage. You can clearly see that by applying bias, you can change the permittivity quite uh, the, the K concentration quite significantly. At the same time, the permittivity can change from positive to negative, or even reaching this uh, ENC with Jim here. So you can also see that the uh, uh, permittivity change is quite strong. You can have a really large permittivity change, but now you have a certain limitation here is the dividing the uh, length of this accumulation layer is actually quite short, only one or two nanometer. That's why if you want to take use of this effect, then what you need is actually integrating to some of the plasmonic or metal surface structure where the field is highly confined in the interface here. So that's why we have been taking use of this uh, few effect TCO material to make a tunable metal surface before. For example, we integrate the ITO to a metallic structure by applying bias, we can able to uh, demonstrate uh, to make a tunable phase shift for pi by applying quite low amount of the voltage here, which have been published a couple of years ago. And at the same time, we are also able to demonstrate using this TCO material integrating to a plasmonic waveguide structure to electrically uh, tuning that so that you can make a plasmonic modulator. We have quite strong modulation strength of 2.7 dB per micron by just applying maybe less than three volt here. And at the same time, you can also, uh, we also decide, for example, making a, a tunable metal surface by making an MIM structure with the ITO then applying the voltage, you can tune in the color filter to tune in the Western or even turn off this color filter application here. So that's why this TCO has been really useful for as a tunable material at the same time so could be useful to integrate for metal surface or even a uh, 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 plasmonic structure as a tunable device. But as I mentioned to you, we're focusing here more on uh, the ENC property. So then to really look at the ENC property of the uh, TCO material, which is quite simple if you want to excite this ENC mode, Basically, you can just have an ITO fin film here. You can excite with certain angle with the prism. Then uh, with a certain phase matching condition, you can excite this ENC mode here. And once you're able to excite this ENC mode, what you find is that you can have a really high field confinement. So basically, the ENC property here is, is the field can enhance significantly on this ENC material. So you can see a really strong enhancement of the electric field uh, on this ENC material here. So what that mean is, is that you can also use it as a, a, a strong absorber. So if you look at the absorption, you can have a perfect absorption band and depending on the care concentration, you can tune this perfect absorption band to different way from you want as well. And just keep in mind to excite the CNC mode, uh, you actually can use a really ultra thin film film. We are talking about maybe lambda divided by 50. That means in the visible wings, maybe we're talking about uh, uh, thickness less than 10 nanometer, which is really ultra thin to make that this kind of strong absorption or strong enhancement of the field. But at the same time, you need a certain combination of angle and thickness to really uh, efficiently couple into this ENC mode here. So what that means, um, you, if you want to really excite this ENC mode, you need to have a really good control on the material in terms of the ENC wavelength and the thickness here. And this is actually uh, why we're actually trying to find a, a fabrication technique. We call this a atomic layer deposition technique to making this ENC material here. So the good thing for this ALD technique is that you can uh, making the uh, layer 
uh, layer by layer in atomic layer thickness. At the same time, you can actually control the property uh, of each layer uh, 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 differently. So that's why you can control the thickness really well at the same time, the property really well on each layer. So then we make an ACL material, one of the TCL material uh, using ALD by using, for example, different uh, zinc oxide and aluminum weight. So you can fine tune this ENC wavelength. And particularly we are talking about uh, targeting in the telecommunication wavelength here. So just to remind again, this ALD allow you to precisely control the ENC wavelength and thickness, which is quite important for exciting the ENC mode. And at the same time, you can also have quite good uh, surface quality, maybe one to two nanometer in waffles. At the same time, this is a conformal deposition. That means you can even coating the metal surface, maybe the sidewall of the metal surface um, using the AL technique, uh, ALD technique, where you can maybe inter even integrate to the metal surface uh, structure using this DNC material here. So then we have been using this technique to making quite good control um, ENC material. So then once you have the good material, then we put in here to the uh, setup. We have a sample here. Then we have a super continuum light source, a broadband light source, and then couple in with a certain angle and prism, and then you can collect with different angles of spectrometer here. And just to show you one of the uh, film film ITO we, we make and the measurement we see for the refraction, you can see you see a refraction dip here which is actually correspond to a ENC mode excitation. And if you look at the amplitude here, which is around 20 dB, so that means it's more than 99% absorption here. So you can see how impressive is that? So you can use only 10, 15 nanometer of, of uh, film film, you can absorb maybe around 100% uh, of light here. And as I mentioned to you, uh, this coupling is quite depending on the thickness of the material, that's why we try to use the ALD to fabricate different thickness of the ACL material. And you can see that the coupling actually uh, changed quite significantly at the same time, the amplitude of the coupling also reduced when you change the thickness here. That's why uh, uh, precisely control the thickness and ENC wavelength is really important. And this actually the ALD can do is uh, control the thickness quite well at the same time, the ENC wavelength you can decide by uh, just uh, doping the material here. So then uh, with this, we was able to demonstrate before, for example, making a, a thin film uh, perfect absorber using the ENC material I mentioned to you. At the same time, we also able to, for example, stacking a multi-layer structure. Instead of one ENC layer, we have uh, three different ENC layer with different ENC wavelength. That means each of the layer will have different uh, care concentration. Then what you can have is a collective excitation of this ENC mode, so as a result, Instead of one single absorption band, you can have a bob band absorption here. So you can really decide the layer and the ENC wavelength to make a bob band effect on this kind of uh, uh, ENC structure. And at the same time, we also able to demonstrate a, a tunable structure, as I mentioned to you, making a, a MOS uh, field effect structure. You can tune uh, the property and we are able to tune in the absorption band uh, uh, for example, uh, couple, uh, uh, by applying a couple of work, you can uh, tune in this uh, absorption band for maybe 15 nanometer at the same time the absorption change could be more than 100 percent here so this is more or less um, uh, some of the linear property about the ENC material and some of the tunable property as well i, I show you here but as i mentioned to you one of the most exciting uh, property for ENC material actually is a linearity of material so that's why um, the last couple of years uh, there are a lot of really exciting demonstration on nonlinear effect in ENC material. For example, Web Boys is the first one to publish in science. A couple of years ago, they find they have a really high curl on in ENC material. That's why there are a lot of excitement in the after a uh, couple of years. And for example, people looking at the curl on in high harmonic generation, or even free smashing free uh, publication, or even using this ENC material for optical switching or polarization control here. So th there are a lot of really interesting physics and nonlinear dynamic uh, to be studied in this ENC material. And particularly um, uh, what we are interested in is can we using some of this ENC material to further engineer the nonlinearity? For example, can we engineer the material to enhancing the nonlinearity or even studying some new um, uh, electron dynamic on this kind of um, uh, ultra thin ENC material, which is some of our motivation. But just to take a look why the ENC material may have a high nonlinearity, 
So there may be a couple of reasons people have been discussing. So for example, one is the ENC laser. You can have a dispersion uh, of this uh, really slow light dispersion of the ENC mode. At the same time, you may have a really strong field confinement. So you can enhance the uh, uh, electric field to enhancing the luminosity. And that's why um, if you try to take a simple approximation, let's say the curl luminosity, the N2, basically inverse proportion to the epsilon, if your epsilon close to zero, then your effective N2 can enhance quite significantly. At the same time, if you're talking about the high harmonic generation, let's say second harmonic generation, the field confinement will be really strongly depending on how uh, the, the, the enhancement of the harmonic generation is really depending on how strong you're enhancing the field. So if you're enhancing the field stronger, you may have a higher harmonic generation here. So that's why um, and maybe five years ago, uh, uh, what boy and also uh, Salai and Fasico group uh, demonstrate quite strong on luminosity at the ENC wavelength, where they find this nonlinear effect is like two order of magnitude in nonlinear Charcotian classes, which is really impressive because the nonlinear Charcotian classes are really quite high luminosity, and they find at this ENC regime they have a really high luminosity here. So that's why we have been uh, trying to work on that and trying to even further engineering this, this ENC material to enhancing the luminosity. And we're using the quite standard C scan uh, measurement technique to measure the luminosity. I try to simplify the setup here. Basically, uh, you can imagine you have an ultra femtosecond uh, laser with a ENC material, and what you have is a detector and aperture here. And what you can do, but by just scanning on the C direction, you can change the intensity of the laser interacting with the material. As a result, you may see different nonlinear reflective index changes. As a result, you may see different spot size changes here. So then with this, then you can kind of uh, correlate what kind of nonlinear effect you may have uh, in this uh, 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 ENC material by just a simple uh, so-called C-scan measurement here. I try to skip some of the details just to give you the uh, uh, value we able to measure, for example, for the ACL material with 76 nanometer fake, we got this uh, N2 and beta 2 value, which is already five order magnitude higher than few silicon glasses. What that mean is that if you need a silica glasses with one centimeter uh, uh, of the material to uh, get a similar phase shift by using this uh, the femtosecond laser power, then um, using a ENC material, you may only need maybe 100 nanometer or less to introduce a similar phase shift with the same power we're using. Here. So this is why you can basically enhance the luminosity for a couple of orders using the ENC material. So, and and another thing is like, as I mentioned to you, the ENC mode actually really depending on how you excite the mode. So which, which will be really depending on the angle of incidence. So if you look at the absorption here, you can see for different angle and wavelength, a certain angle you may excite the modes much stronger so that you can have a stronger absorption. So that's why if you look at the angular distribution, uh, you may see different angular dependency on the uh, N2 longinality as well. So then this is what we did. And we changed the angle and look at two different beam. One is a 76 nanometer, 205 nanometer thickness beam. And you can clearly see that by changing the angle in a certain wave uh, angle, then you can have a much higher enhancement because of the better excitation of the mole. And also if you compare with different thickness, we, we find actually we have a stronger enhancement in smaller thin film here. So clearly you have an angular dependency and thickness dependency. Basically the smaller the thin film, the thinner the thin film of the ENC mode, the stronger the enhancement you can have because you have a stronger electric field enhancement. So then we also uh, try to look at the uh, temporal dynamics. So uh, using a standard pump up technique, you have a pump and pump and looking on the response time, then this is the uh, standard uh, pump up chase uh, with the delay. You can see we have a relaxation time of 130 feet per second. That means you can enhancing the luminosity at the same time, you can also have a quite fast luminosity effect as well in this kind of ENC material. And uh, there are actually uh, quite a lot of things that I haven't been able to uh, tell you, but basically we're able to control the luminosity by just changing the thickness of the ENC material or the field confinement of the material. You can engineer the luminosity. At the same time, we find there's some interesting uh, electron dynamic. Also, there's some interesting luminosity effect uh, physics which haven't been uh, really studied well so far on this kind of ENC material, which is something we're still exploring and hopefully we can uh, explain with you a little bit more later next time. So anyway, um, 
I told you about the high nonlinearity. What we are currently also working on is how to integrating this kind of ENC material to metal surface so that we can enhancing the nonlinearity of the metal surface at the same time. Maybe we can even tuning that so that you can actively control the harmonic generation or nonlinear optical switching. For example, uh, uh, some of the vision will be you can uh, making a high harmonic generation, which could be enhanced by ENC material at the same time. Maybe you can even electrically tuning that as well so that you can make an ultra fast holograph or image encoding or even uh, controllable uh, tunable metal surface or even optical uh, switches as well. At the same time, we are also trying to integrate into some of the uh, uh, Leno circuit as well. So we have been working on plasmonic uh, circuit. We can make a couple of resonator gesture, but uh, this will be quite exciting. If we can integrate in some highly nonlinear material so that you can use it for uh, nonlinear optical switching in a, a Leno optical chip, this is something uh, I think um, will be quite exciting if we can uh, do that using this kind of ENC material here. So uh, this is so far, um, I told you about the first part about the linear and nonlinear of the ENC material. I just want to quickly see if any quick question for the first part of my talk. Okay. If not, then we keep continuing about the second part to tell you a little bit about how we actually studying the emission of the 2D material, uh, which could be enhanced on a 2D uh, material, uh, on a ENC material, sorry. So, and uh, when we talk about the spontaneous emission on a ENC medium, so uh, there already have been uh, some study there, for example, uh, from Andrea Liu group, they have been looking on the ENC waveguide structure, uh, where they look at the enhanced emission, for example, this kind of ENC channel, they have a, a waveguide cutoff, which is correspond to a ENC, uh, ENC property. So they find they have some enhancement there. At the same time, there are people working on, for example, multi-layer structure, aluminum and metal, and making a so-called hyperbolic uh, metal material which have a ENC crossing point and they find they have some enhancement on this uh, ENC cavity here on the, on the PL uh, uh, photoluminescence enhancement here. So but, uh, what we are particularly interested in is can we uh, kind of even enhancing the emission in the isotropic ENC material because most of the study haven't been really looking on the isotropic ENC medium just like a ENC film film. At the same time, actually we are quite surprised there are not too many experimental demonstrations on looking on the enhancement, uh, enhancement of the emission on the ENC medium. That's why we have been uh, trying to be looking at that uh, 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 enhancing the emission on the ENC uh, uh, film film or, or, or structure here. So then the uh, motivation is quite simple. Uh, we want, want to look at the enhancement emission uh, and then uh, using a ENC material uh, called titanium nitride material uh, which have a ENC wavelength in visible range at the same time using a 2D material as a simple emitter to look at this uh, physics here. So then the idea basically is quite simple. We have a 2D material, we use the MOS2 material monolayer, and then we have an oxide in between, and then we have a titanium uh, nitride uh, as a ENC material, which is a single crystal uh, ENC material. And um, then the couple of questions we actually want to uh, 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 study here is, can we actually really enhancing the spontaneous emission near the isotropic ENC medium? Is there any spectral dependency or is there any dependency due to the oxide spacer thickness? Also, how would be the impact on the losses of the ENC material, which is some of the motivation of this uh, study here. So then uh, to tell you a little bit about the um, uh, ENC material we have been using this uh, uh, uh a titanium nitride film film uh, as a ENC substrate, which have a, a visible uh, uh, ENC wavelength. So uh, we, we collaborate with a group in Taiwan, they grow with the MBE grow, they can make a single crystal titanium nitride material. And the property of the uh, uh, titanium nitride is actually they have really good uh, material. They are strong, they have a high melting point and you can make a, a single crystal film film as well. And I know Guo is actually also one of the pioneers making titanium nitride material as well. And other than that, this um, titanium nitride, the good thing is that, uh, again, you can make a single crystal with a really large area, uh, 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 thin film uh, like this here. But one good thing is actually you can have a, a visible ENC wavelength on this kind of titanium nitride material. So for example, if you look at the permittivity here, 
for the MBE group, titanium nitride have a ENC wavelength around 500 nanometer, and, and you can also start to be uh, titanium nitride, and you can have a ENC around 560 nanometer. So basically, you can control the ENC wavelength in the visible range where most of the emitter actually emit, um, uh, they are emit in a uh, visible range. That's why you can take use of this ENC effect here. And at the same time, they are relatively low loss as well. So if you look at the MBE titanium nitride, they compare with uh, metal like gold, they have a much lower loss in uh, visible range uh, below for some of 540 nanometer compared with gold. And that's why you can use it as a low loss and metallic uh, material as well. So then uh, we have been using this as a ENC clean film to study the emission. And the emitter we're using is using the monolayer MOS2. So we uh, bought it from a company, a monolayer, and then my student used a drive stem uh, technique to uh, transfer to the titanium nitride. And the reason we use this MOS2 as a emitter because uh, they have a, a warm temperature, visible photoluminescence. At the same time, you can excite this uh, emission in quite broad band uh, with GM in the visible range. At the same time, so they have quite stable PL uh, emission. They don't have a blinking. Also, they're quite homogeneous. That means you have a, just a mono layer. You can really control the spacing between the emitter and the ENC material quite exactly because they are a mono layer on, on, on the surface. And also they have an emission in plane, so uh, you can model that quite easily. So then if you look at the, for example, the uh, absorption coefficient, basically you can excite this uh, 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 MOS2 in the visible range and then they emit the, the photoluminescence around uh, eight, uh, 680 nanometer here, the, the wet curve here. So then the study basically is quite simple. Again, we have a MOS2 emitter oxide and then uh, a ENC material as titanium nitride. And then we compare with a reference where we don't have um, the titanium nitride, basically we have the sapphire below as a reference here. So then if you just try to take a look on the photoluminescence uh, image, you can clearly see already um, you have a stronger enhancement, stronger light coming out from the uh, structure with the ENC uh, uh, film film below compared with the weapons. But what we also want to do is also looking on the spectral dependency. For example, we have a ENC wavelength around 500 nanometer. We want to see uh, what kind of uh, uh, effect when we, for example, exciting across the ENC wavelength in the lower wavelength side or longer wavelength side, how the uh, photoluminescence will be changing. So then if you, uh, what we do basically taking the spectrum by exciting in different wavelength, then you can see this typical spectrum. You can see basically the titanium nitride have much stronger PL enhancement compared with the weapons. And then we try to uh, integrate all and try to looking on the different wavelength, basically looking on any uh, enhancement because of the ENC uh, uh, wavelength here or ENC uh, film film here. So then what you expect to see, just to give you a quick uh, overview, is you will see, for example, some excitation wavelength and then the PL enhancement, you may see some dependency across the ENC wavelength. You may have different dependency on the dielectric side and metallic side, which is something we will look at that a little bit more. Basically, we're looking at different excitation and looking on the uh, PL enhancement here. So then um, to kind of uh, simulate what kind of uh, PL enhancement you may have, uh, you can uh, actually uh, simulate that by just looking on the total electromagnetic enhancement. Basically have two important part. One is excitation enhancement and one is the emission enhancement. So the excitation enhancement is telling you how much enhanced absorption you can absorb on the MOS2 due to the ENC substrate. So you can enhance the emission then you can have an excitation enhancement. And the emission enhancement basically is telling you how much the uh, emission decay weight will change if you're collecting a certain angle of collection by uh, monitoring in the far field. So which will be related to the uh, pressure uh, factor enhancement and also the external quantum diffusion enhancement. Basically, it's a quantity telling you how much emission enhancement you have. And combine those, you can actually have a total uh, electromagnetic enhancement uh, to calculate that. So just try to skip some of the details uh, of what you can uh, expect to see. You may have some dependency on the oxide thickness, the linear oxide thickness. At the same time, the thickness of the ENC material may also affect this PL enhancement here. Yeah. So which is something we're trying to explore experimentally. So then this is a simulation result for different spacer thickness from zero to 300 nanometer with different excitation wavelengths. So you can see the ENC wavelength is here. 
we can clearly see that um, for the left-hand side will be dielectric di di side and the right-hand side wavelength will be metallic side. So you can clearly see that you have a stronger enhancement in the metallic side. And you also see some kind of resonance here as a fibro resonance because you're forming a metallic film film at, at the bottom. As a result, you're forming a resonant cavity. That's why you have uh, some kind of resonant enhancement here. But this is for the wings of the spatial thickness from the really large ring from zero to 300 nanometer. If you take a closer look in a smaller spatial thickness, this aluminum oxide thickness from zero to 10 nanometer, you find actually you have certain enhancement here close to the ENC wavelength, which is due to the ENC material, you actually have a certain enhancement when you have a small thickness uh, range, uh, spatial thickness range here. So that means you clearly see that depending on the spatial thickness, you may have different regime, small spatial thickness, and large spatial thickness, you have different enhancement. Then experimentally, what we do, we actually fabricating with uh, different spatial thickness. One is small spatial thickness, and one is a thick uh, spatial thickness, and to look at the uh, PL enhancement here. So then this is a result for the thick one, uh, thick aluminum oxide spacer, 30 nanometer. And for two different uh, titanium nitride film, 58 nanometer, 120 nanometer. And the ENC wavelength, this one is here. And uh, for the left-hand side will be the dielectric property, right-hand side will be metallic property. You can clearly see that um, you have some transition across this ENC wavelength from dielectric to metallic, your PL enhancement uh, will enhance when you're causing this uh, ENC regime. And for the figure film, you find the uh, enhancement even stronger, so you have a stronger PL enhancement in this uh, metallic side, basically because you have a stronger uh, absorption enhancement on the mono, mono layer. But now, if you try to take a look on another titanium nitride ENC film film, which is butter film film, with a longer ENC wavelength, what you find, basically your PL enhancement is much weaker than the uh, MBE gold titanium nitride. So maybe a few, uh, few times smaller. And there are two reasons of that, because one is that they are actually dielectric side. At the same time, if you take a look again, uh, uh, the loss uh, of this uh, material, started film film and MBE grow, basically your MBE grow have much lower loss. That's why you have a much stronger PL enhancement. And that's, that's also why you actually can enhance stronger the absorption on the monolayer so you have an enhanced excitation enhancement to enhancing this uh, PR enhancement. But I think the key message here is um, across this ENC wavelength, you have a really uh, strong transition between dielectric and metallic, which enhancing quite a lot the PL uh, emission. And the losses here play a quite a big role as well. So then if we go to the lower uh, thickness, like six nanometer, for the MBE titanium nitride and sputter titanium nitride, you can see that uh, this is a ENC wavelength. You have a peak of the PL enhancement really close to the ENC wavelength. So clearly you can see that you have an enhancement due to the ENC uh, effect here. And what we find actually basically around this ENC wavelength, you have a stronger excitation enhancement and you have a stronger absorption actually and it absorb the light in the mono layer. That's why you have a stronger enhancement near the ENC wavelength. And this, um, uh, uh, Again, the lower the losses, you actually have a high enhancement here, for example, compared to the MBE titanium nitride and sputter titanium nitride. So this is uh, some of the interesting observation. You can really enhance the PL enhancement by using ENC material. At the same time, the losses will play a, a quite key role here. And what we are currently doing is we think that actually we can even electrically tuning this uh, uh, enhancement by biasing the structure, as I mentioned to you, by applying voltage and able to control the uh, absorption at the same time so controlling the PL enhancement as well, which is something we're currently working on. So, so far I told you about a uh, different topic about the ENC material, but I just want to emphasize again, this is a really exciting material. And that's why we have been uh, working on different topic on that. For example, we have been working on absorption, non-linear effect, or even looking on some of the uh, sensing or on chip application. Uh, an, an, an enhancement of the emission, as I mentioned to you, or recently we're actually quite interested to even able to enhancing the thermal emission or even tuning that by using some of the titanium nitride ENC uh, metal surface or material here. So that's why there are a lot of exciting field and I would like uh, to really emphasize this is a really uh, new material which haven't been studied too much so far. 
So uh, this is the uh, second part of my talk. Maybe in the next uh, uh, few minutes, I will just uh, quickly tell you another quite different area on how we actually integrating some of this um, meta surface or ENC material into a completely different platform in the optical fiber platform here. So as I think most of you know really well, uh, what is optical fiber basically is a two piece of glasses. You can use the total internal reflection, the guiding light. And this optical fiber basically is like a dimension of the human hair. So that's why you can have a really long and really small piece of glasses to guiding light for really long distance with low loss. And that's also why you have a really good internet nowadays uh, for optical communications uh, because they can guiding light for long distance with low loss. And in my opinion, actually, um, this kind of optical fiber uh, immersion is actually one of the most important immersion nowadays because uh, you can imagine if you don't have a fast internet nowadays, everything will change. We cannot uh, chat email. I don't even able to uh, talk with you live in Zoom now, or even the student cannot uh, go to Facebook or even watching movie in YouTube, etc. So uh, our life will completely change without the optical fiber. And that's why the father of optical fiber, Charlie Crow, I got a Nobel Prize around 10 years ago on the contribution on the fiber optics for optical communications. And unfortunately, he passed away more than a year ago. So we lost one great scientist in optics. But anyway, other than optical communications, uh, there are other many uh, important applications for fiber optics, for example, uh, imaging, sensing, or even uh, fiber laser. These have been really uh, good application, have been well developed for already 20, 30 years. But still, if you try to take a look on this kind of optical fiber, what you will find, you actually still have certain limitation here. For example, you have a limitation on the dielectric material you're using. At the same time, the geometry you need to make a single mode, uh, you're limited. So that means that you cannot really change it. At the same time, once you fabricate this fiber optic from a fiber joint tower like this, then all the property is already fixed. For example, the phase, amplitude, polarization, or mode property. So you can't really control it after you fabricate the fiber. So you may actually able to find some different component or device to change the property. For example, you can find four lab, like a fiber collimator, lenses, an isolator or, or modulator, just to change the property of optical fiber. But you can still tell that actually they are really bulky at the same time. So they, they are quite costly at the same time, they may be not so efficient as well. So that's exactly why my research a group is interested to think about, can we integrate some of the new uh, development of, for example, this kind of metal surface, new material to fiber optics to develop a new kind of fiber. Uh, for example, we call this a meta fiber, which have a new functionality uh, or overcome some of the functionality where uh, the optical fiber uh, is, is limited. So then the idea, basically, we, we can extend the functionality to new functionality or even minimizing the fiber component or using this as a new optical excitation platform. This is some of the goal for uh, this study here. And we even actually want to make it tunable as well. For example, if we can electrically tuning so that you can control all the optical property on a fiber, that would be really uh, fantastic. But this is something a uh, little bit longer term goal uh, in our research here. But anyway, what we are interested in our group have been working on, for example, integrating metal surface on fiber, nano wire, or even circuit on fiber. But uh, in this talk, we focus a little bit more about metal surface and, and metallic wire here. And basically, just to keep in mind, again, the fiber is like a human hair dimension. That means we are making the structure in the core, which is really small. That means more or less uh, making a, a structure in the, in the hair. So you just keep in mind the structure here is really tiny here but you can change the optical property. So then just to show you, maybe first things uh, we have to demonstrate is, for example, making a lenses. So we're able to make a, a so-called meta surface lenses, meta lenses, ultra thin lenses on a fiber, you can focus on light uh, at the end phase. So then to make a lenses, then it's, it's quite simple. For example, conventional lenses like our glasses, they are quite thick, a couple of millimeter. And this exactly my glasses, I have a quite short side, uh, 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 glasses, so that's why you see it's quite fake glasses. But in order to making the lenses, typically you need this kind of face uh, 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 profile. That's why you need this kind of uh, curvature here or different thickness here to get the optical path to making this kind of face profile to making a lens like like this uh, conventionally. But then metal surface lens will be like a ultra thin lenses, like maybe hundred nanometer fake. 
And what we do on achieving this face profile is using so-called geometric face, using this kind of um, uh, Western structure. What we can do is by just rotating this structure, we can achieve different face by rotating the angle. You can changing the face but at the same time, uh, keeping the similar efficiency. So this is the trick about the so-called geometric phase metal surface. You can just rotating the angle to achieve certain phase you need. So then to decide the lens, then uh, this is the phase you need. Then what we can do is just rotating the angle to achieve the phase profile we need for making this lens. And if you want to make different lenses, basically you have different phase profile, then you just need to have different uh, rotational uh, distribution to making another lenses here. So then uh, the fiber we have been using to make the lens is using a photonic crystal fiber. I try to skip some of the details here, basically using this kind of holy structure, you can uh, control the light in the core. And the good thing is that you can also engineer the size of the core. So that's why we're using this as a large uh, mold area fiber. We have a 25 micron core so that we can uh, making more element inside the core of the fiber here. So then to fabricate the structure, we coat the thin film of gold 40 nanometer and then using a focus ion beam to mill the structure. And uh, this is the structure my uh, student makes. So you can see in the core of the fiber, we're making this tiny slit and rotating the geometry, the angle, so that you can have a, a rotating geometry to achieve the phase profile we need uh, to make the lenses. And this is for one lenses and we can actually make another lenses with different uh, distribution here. And just to keep in mind again, uh, uh, the dimension of the optical fiber, this is the fiber itself. And this is my hair, a 100 micron. And the core is inside and we're making actually metal surface at the, at, the, at the center of the core. So we're making really tiny structure, more or less like on, on the end phase of the, of the hair. So then uh, to characterize this, that's quite simple. We have a tunable laser. We have a, a, a metal surface here. We have a camera here. And we launch a, a right hand polarization state and collect the left hand polarization state. And what we also do is to scan the C direction with the camera. So then, at certain position you find you have a high intensity, which is actually the focus point of the lenses. So then, um, uh, we measure, for example, uh, for different wavelengths, and uh, we see uh, for uh, uh, this lens, we have 30 micron focal lengths for different wavelengths and for another lens is around 40 micron, they're quite consistent with different wavelengths. And compared with simulation, we have a quite good agreement between simulation and experiment as well. So just to give you a little bit about the number, the focal lengths, they're quite constant in this uh, uh, telecommunication wavelength for two different lenses here. And the efficiency also quite decent around 15%. Uh, so this is already quite good for a uh, metallic structure because uh, you have some losses here uh, 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 induced in the metallic structure. But what we find if we're making a, a dielectric metal surface, actually we can uh, make the efficiency much higher on 90%. So which is something we have been currently working on um, to making a dielectric metal surface to enhance the efficiency, which somehow may be a little bit more tricky because we need to use a UBM lithography to um, patterning this uh, dielectric metal surface, which is something we have been working on that. And just to give you a little bit idea on uh, 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 things we have been uh, kind of hoping is uh, not only making a, a lenses, but also tunable. For example, if we have high voltage, we can tuning that, that would be a lot of uh, advantage here, even on, a, on, on fiber uh, structure here, tunable metal optical fiber structure. Just to give you a little bit about the potential application on uh, this kind of uh, metal fiber. So for example, for endoscope, uh, this has been really successful using optical fiber for imaging the body. So, but uh, if you take a look on the uh, component size, they're really complicated. For example, they may have a, a spitter, they have a lenses, they have a, a, a scanning element, etc. So you can imagine if we can uh, replacing with a metal surface or tunable metal surface, there may be a lot of uh, potential for this kind of uh, fiber imaging uh, capability. And also for surgery, for example, this uh, 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 company have been really successful using CO2 laser for surgery. Uh, but again, um, uh, uh, the mole profile or the focus spot structure, they're fixed on this kind of fiber. So potentially this kind of uh, metal, metal surface fiber or tunable metal surface fiber have a lot of potential on even surgery application. Or even for uh, uh, trapping or laser chaser uh, application, for example, people using two fiber using the uh, force uh, a laser uh, a gradient to trapping the particle or even cell or even deform the cell. 
But there are limitations here on typical uh, lace uh, optical fiber chaser. For example, they have a soft inter inter interaction length. And also you cannot control the face phone and also you cannot control the power easily uh, 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 in, in the fiber here. So then uh, this kind of uh, metal surface or tunable metal surface fiber could potentially use for trapping because you can actually even engineer the face phone, for example, making a, a vessel beam with a last depth of focus or changing the uh, wave funds, or even electrical tunable or even creating a new light source directly on the fiber here. So we think there are a lot of potential here. And uh, actually recently there's some nice study as well, for example, uh, from the group, the Marcus Summit group in Vienna and also Seven Mile group. Um, they actually making some of the, uh, using 3D printing to making metal lenses on fiber and they're able to using for trapping particle treasure. Uh, this is really a nice demonstration, but uh, the material they're using is a polymer. So that means that uh, you may have a limitation on the laser power you can use here. But anyway, this is a really exciting field where we can look at as well. So I think uh, my time is almost up. Maybe one last thing is like, uh, instead of making a metal surface, we're also growing nano wire. We have been, for example, using uh, electron beam induced metal deposition. We're actually able to grow in nano wire at the end phase of the fiber. And we can really precisely control, for example, length and width by using this technique here. And we think we actually can be really useful. For example, we can make a slit, making a wire. Then we can actually launching this um, with a linear polarization, we can actually have the plasmonic excitation to make a hotspot at the end of the tip with really high confinement. And we think this could be useful for Wyman's spectroscopy because you can just couple the light through the fiber and excite and collect uh, directly. So you can use for Wyman uh, spectroscopy uh, without any coupling, uh, using a tip enhanced Wyman for maybe molecule detection or DNA uh, detection of treasure. So this is something we have been uh, working with uh, with the college with Baylor, making some of the home view STM to integrate this kind of uh, fiber test to uh, hoping to uh, enhancing the keep enhanced uh, warming uh, capability here. So uh, let me conclude my thought. I uh, don't want to repeat again, but I told you how we're actually using nanostructure new material to study different light matter injection at the same time find a, a little bit of different application here. I uh, want to acknowledge the people in my group, uh, like uh, postdoc now that uh, they're all in UCI, for example, PhD and also postdoc and undergrad, and a couple of uh, uh, students uh, still working in my previous institute, uh, working on uh, different projects as well. So uh, again, we're looking for a student and postdoc, and let me know if you know any good student, uh, please feel free to contact me as well. And just a lot of the people uh, collaborator from uh, uh, US, like Bernie Scully, Alexi from a and and people in Naval Research Lab, Caltech, and people from Europe, and also from Asia, like uh, Limping Chai, Felix Core from Taiwan, and also the funding agency supporting the research in the last couple of years. I think that's all for my uh, uh, talk, and thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer uh, any question. Uh Thank you, Howard. Uh, that was an exciting talk. Uh, but if there are any questions, um, yes, okay. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, let me read whatever he has uh, got here okay. as a question. Could you please compare the field enhancement efficiency between nano resonator made by traditional methods, materials, and ENZ materials? For example, nonlinear nonlinearity enhancement. Since the imaginary part of epsilon is always greater than zero, it limits the field enhancement of ENZ material. Thus, is there any way that imaginary epsilon can also be tuned at the ENZ point? Yeah, so, yeah, this is a great question. So, for sure, um, uh, definitely we have certain losses in the ENZ material. And, but still, the field enhancement itself, for example, particularly the longinearity. Uh, you actually enhance quite a lot using this ENC material, even you have losses here. So that's that's one of the exciting things, like even you have losses, you can enhance the longinearity or even some of the free enhancement quite significantly. But certainly if you even able to find the loss material uh, even lower, your longinearity could go up quite significantly or if, even all the effects we have been talking about. So this is something quite exciting. That means if we can find some low loss ENC material, you can even enhance maybe a couple of other amenities as well. 
So and to tuning that, that is possible as well. So for example, when you're tuning the electron density, you actually can tuning the losses as well. But there's some other material. Um, this is something we also exploring is to find some material, maybe even lower loss that could even find a, a more application on that. But still, if we talk about just using a tiny material, maybe 10 nanometer, 20 nanometer, or inside the waveguide structure, your losses on this uh, interaction length is, 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 is quite low. So uh, this is kind of trade off, uh, but certainly you have enhancement here by using material. Um, there is no follow up from Wei Jin. Uh, Frank has the next question. Frank, do you want to speak? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my question was about um, the difference between EMZ mode um, compared to surface plasmon, Flariton. Um, and maybe like what sort of advantages are there in using um, like this ENZ mode as compared to just say like SPG? Yeah, so it's a, another good question as well. So I would say actually ENZ mode actually is part of the surface plasma mode as well. So if you look at one of the paper called theory of the ENC material, I think from an Eagle Banner. So basically the ENC property happen when your film film making really thin, maybe lambda divided by 50, lambda divided by 100 then all your field will be actually confined on this ENC material. So you can kind of think this is a kind of a, a plasmonic property, but now you're actually having a really thin film. So all the field will be confined only on the ENC material, not outside on the, on the external medium, which is slightly different than the surface plasmon. But just keep in mind, for example, even metal, like you have a, a seal causing pond as well. You also can have a ENC property or ENC mode as well. But now because you're, your ENC in the UE range, that means you need to make the thin film really thin, maybe a few nanometer in order to uh, excite this mode. So, but uh, you can also support ENC mode in metal as well. Okay, so is this sort of similar maybe to like a gas plasmon type? Um, I would not say the same things. Uh, it's slightly different, but I would say it's like a surface plasmon mode going down to a really thin film. You can have a really strong enhancement on the field. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Abu, uh, Abu Shan has a question. Uh, uh, yeah, to... yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay, uh, well, uh, thank you for the uh, very for presentation. So my question is about, so does your group engage in researches related to the synthesis of the materials and the structures mentioned in your slices? Yes, so definitely. So actually one of the big part is uh, for us is the making making the ENC material. So for example, uh, we find the ALD making that actually uh, taking quite a lot of advantage on that. And then we also do, for example, sputtering. So then we can actually making, um, tuning the even ITO or titanium nitride material by using sputtering techniques. So uh, one of the big part for us is actually making the material at the same time, maybe patterning the structure to enhancing some of the, let's say, metal surface or ENC property. But this is one of the important thing. Again, uh, I think finding or even making a low loss ENC material could be uh, one of the very exciting uh, research area for the field. Okay, cool. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you. While uh, <clears throat> if there are more questions, please uh, uh, type or uh, let me know by the writing hand. But in the meanwhile, let me ask uh, Howard a question. So, yeah. which is related to your work on uh, titanium nitride and molybdenum disulfide. So, that is really cool in the mm -hmm. sense uh, you are trying to um, control the, the photoluminescence, the emission from molybdenum disulfide by using EMT um, uh, properties. Mm -hmm. So, my uh, question was related to how do you optimize or how do you avoid quenching here? So how do you <laughs> let the modes actually uh, come come out of free space, the photons come out of free, free space, and then uh, win over the competition with absorption? Yeah, that's, that's why, yeah, it's a good question again. So, so this is one of the reasons why we have a space of uh, layer where we kind of, kind of avoiding to directly touching the uh, ENC material, which is one of the way to do that. But yeah, why actually we are not, we are not looking on all the long radiative emission. Mm -hmm. So we, um, that, that actually could potentially could, could be studied, for example, by making some grating or making 
um, metallic structure to emit the uh, long wave emission. Mm -hmm. But in our study at the moment, it's not uh, uh, include that. At the same time, we haven't really looked at, for example, the lifetime. So uh, we haven't really cooled down the temperature as well. So mm -hmm. I would say it's still an initial study, but a lot of, I think, interesting things could be further extend, for example, as I say, maybe even make it tunable. That could be also quite exciting as well. Yeah, do you see even uh, strong coupling, for example, even push the exciton emission to a frequency higher than the, 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 the lowest exciton energy? So can you even uh, modify that, for example? Yeah, so that one we have to we haven't really look at that because we're kind of limited on some of the excitation windows we can, we can uh, work with. But there potentially you can operate in it, even exciting in a longer wavelength gesture. So, which is also quite, quite exciting as well. Yeah. And, yeah. but, but again, so um, what we find here mainly the, the enhancement is actually due to the, uh, due to the uh, absorption or excitation enhancement, basically en enhancing the absorption to the model layer. So the pressure enhancement for some of the case actually uh, is not so high. So, but this could be something uh, could be further engineering at the same time, maybe looking on some of the long radiative emission as well. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> that's cool. I and I look forward to uh, more papers on from your group on these topics and also the thermal radiation metasurface, which uh, seem to be very exciting, and we yeah. should really talk more about that. Yeah, that would be exciting to find some collaboration as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, there seems to be no other question. If, if there is none, uh, let's thank the speaker, Howard Lee, once again. And uh, thank you very much for uh, making time to give this wonderful webinar. Hope we can have you in person sometime. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Hope to see you again in person soon. And thank you again for the invitation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Talk to you guys later. Yeah.